All right. Hey, South Point Church, it's so good to be here. It's so good to, uh, yeah, just to be in front of you, even though I'm not physically in front of you. I know that right now, for those of you that are logged online, I am in front of you. So I just want to say thanks for showing up. Uh, Welcome to church today. If you don't know me, um, if I'm new to you, and maybe if it's a complete surprise that you see lead pastor under my name, then maybe there's a, an email and a spam folder somewhere that you're unaware of, and, and you, you should go back and look at that, because there's been some really exciting, fun things happening here at South Point over the break. Today, we are going to start a brand new series called How Not to Be Your Own Worst Enemy. I think it's going to be really fun. It's three parts, but... Today we're going to start with with part one, but before we get into that, I'm going to tell you guys a couple stories. So this is, this is the first one's going to be funny. Have you ever been like walking into a spur or walking into a wimpy or something and you see somebody coming up behind you and you think, oh, I'm going to be a nice person. I'm going to hold the door open for that person. You know, I'm going to just wait on them to come in. Well, one day I found myself walking up. And I decided yeah, I'm going to hold the door open and be a nice guy. And this, this lady behind me was walking in. And um, I, I glanced at her and I just thought to myself, um, actually, I didn't think, but words came out of my mouth. And I said, hey, when's the baby due? And as the words came out of my mouth, I thought to myself, grab the words because she's not pregnant. You've made a huge mistake here, Chris. You've made an incredible mistake. But at that point, you can't grab the words. And so I just held the door. She walked through, looked at me like I was a scumbag, and then went on with it. That's, that's the only time I've ever made that mistake. I hope that's the last time that I'll ever make that mistake. Um, the second story I want to tell you guys is about a time in my life when I was in high school. And what we used to do, we didn't drink, we didn't party. But what my friends and I used to do is we used to go to golf courses at night. And so we would always sleep over at my, my friend's house because his parents didn't care if we left or if we came or whatever. And so we would go out and about midnight, 1 a.m., we would sneak into a golf course and we would get on the golf course and we would steal all the golf flags. And then we would go to another golf course and we would steal those flags and we would switch the flags. So what would end up happening is the next morning uh, they would have a tournament and they would show up to get ready for the tournament and they would realize that their flags don't match their course. And so then it would take some time for the two courses to figure out, okay, someone switched the flags. What well, turns out... I got into an incredible amount of trouble for doing that. Personally, I don't understand why. For me, it, it just uh, exuded the fact that I was committed. I mean, if you ever walked 18 holes, well, in one night, we were walking 36 holes. Uh, plus, we were sneaking and having to be covert about it. So I feel like we were committed, that we were determined, and we were innovative. And what it ended up happening is I knew that that was wrong. Okay, I, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was wrong. And, and every time I jumped a fence, I felt a little bit of tension. Like, yeah, we weren't partying, we weren't drinking, but, but every time I jumped a fence, I thought, ah, is this wrong? And then, then I, I took myself to, no, Chris, you're dedicated. This is, this is commitment. You're really selling out to this thing. So I know those are kind of like, kind of some funny examples of tension. You know, the, the tension that I felt holding the door for a lady who isn't pregnant. Uh, the tension that I felt jumping a fence uh, when I knew that that was wrong and I was doing it anyway, uh, you know, those are funny. But sometimes we also have maybe some serious tensions. And the first step to becoming your own worst enemy is one bad decision. So in this series, we're talking about how not to become your own worst enemy. And oftentimes what, what happens is it just takes a tiny little step and then we're in that position where we're becoming our own worst enemy. So for me, the first step to jumping fences and stealing golf flags was, was a bad decision to hang out with a friend that had no parental supervision. So it was like the first step, it, it took me there. And then I started you know, down, down that pathway. But it's, it sneaks up on you. And it actually sneaks up on others. 
Okay, it kind of comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden you find that, yeah, maybe it, was, it started with one bad decision, but then it, it kind of sneaks up on you and it becomes more bad decisions. And so this, is so this is so key for us. Every habit begins with the first time. Every pattern begins with the first line. Every journey begins with the first step. That's either life or a great Taylor Swift song. But every habit begins with the first time. It always starts with something. Every pattern begins with the first line. It, it, there's, a, there's a beginning point for everything that we're doing. Every journey begins with the first step. So you, you, everything starts. Everything has a starting point. And that's where I want to start us with on this series is, is there's a starting point. So what can you guys expect in this series? You know, so far we've, we've told some jokes. We've talked about things. Um, you know we're going to talk about how not to be your own worst enemy, but I'm going to give you three things that you guys can do that are going to prevent you from becoming your own worst enemy. These are practical things that you can do. These are things that you're going to be able to train yourself in and learn and do, and it's going to set yourself up. It's going to be a lot better for you. And the reason that I'm doing this is I don't want you to have regrets. Okay, you, so you're important to me. Like, you matter. Like, you as a person are a valuable thing. You really, really, really matter. And so this message is important because you're loved. It's really important because you're loved. And so the first habit that we're gonna talk about is, this, is this, this concept of, I want you to pay attention to the tension. So now maybe all those other uh, stories that I told make sense. As I was maybe jumping a fence, I should have paid attention to that tension. You know, so what else does this look like? What does it look like to pay attention to the tension? What it looks like is when you're doing something and you know it's wrong and you kind of start to feel that like that gut feeling that's like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't do that. That's that little bit of, of tension that starts to build. When, when you're about to spend money on something and all of a sudden you're like, ah, you know, credit card, reality, things like that. It's like, what, you know, the, the tension starts to build in you. And instead of just saying, no, I'm going to do it anyway and deal with it later, what, what we want to do is we want to pay attention to that tension. But what happens is you start to develop the tension, Okay, it comes. So you know that you shouldn't spend that money. You know you shouldn't do that thing. You know that, that what you're doing is giving you a little bit of like the, the heebie-jeebies. So the tension is building. It's building. And, and, and you're like, oh, your brain says, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't do that. But then something gets in the way of that. So the, the problem that we have is that we have this amazing internal salesman. And this internal salesman constantly sits in battle with the tension that we feel. So, I mean, it's, and this internal salesman is the best salesman that you'll ever know, okay? Because they're so good at selling you on things that you know you shouldn't do. So, to, to exemplify this, or to bring you guys an example, we're going to play a little bit of a game. And it's, it's what I like to call the, the salesman game. And what I want you to think is, is how would you feel if you heard the statements that, that we're going to see up here on the screen? How would you feel? What would it make you feel like? What, what are the things, because these are some of the things that you tell yourself, and you've convinced yourself that that's okay, but pretend that you're walking into your favorite retail shop, and you walk in, and you're buying a whatever, and a salesman comes up, and you hear the word, hey, if you get home and decide you don't like it, just donate it. It's like, okay, okay. So that's, maybe that doesn't make sense, you know. Hey, I see that you already have one of these things that already does everything that this one does, but this one is newer, so go ahead and spend that money. That's a favorite one of mine. I love this one right here. My internal salesman can convince me of this right here um, to buy almost anything. This is why I don't go to Woolworths. When we do our grocery shopping, Casey goes to Woolworths because otherwise my internal salesman says, no, you can come home with new shiny things. So yes, you have cereal, but this other cereal is better. So that's why Casey does the shopping. Um, I think we've got another one that'll come up here. Uh, this is a good one. Yes, sir. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is wrong. So just don't tell anyone. 
I mean, that, that's a bit of a harsh one, but our internal salesman does that. Sometimes we tell ourselves, hey, wrong, 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 wrong. Ah, just don't tell anybody about it, you know? So another one could be, sure, your husband would be hurt and offended if he found out, but your husband isn't bright enough to find out. You're good. You're in the clear. You can do that. Yes, your girlfriend would be devastated, but let's face it, she's not nearly as attractive. That one actually is like hard for me to say out loud uh, because I just I can't handle the idea of hurting somebody like that. But some of us out there, guys, we, we have this voice in our head, this internal salesman says, no, it's okay for you to do that. So what we do is we take our own self and we convince ourselves of these things. That it's amazing that, that we can get ourselves to do the things that we would otherwise never do. Things that we would think are just absolutely crazy. If you fast forward through your decisions and you think, oh my goodness, I would never do that. But if you go through the process that the internal salesman takes you through and you don't pay attention to your tension, then all of a sudden you find that you're doing things that you would have never thought that you would do. How easy are we convinced by what goes on in our thoughts because we ignore what goes on in our heart that we find ourselves doing this when we would have otherwise never thought that we would have done it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it starts with some funny stories and we all have those funny stories. You know, we, we all have those. But then it gets a little bit serious. You know, it, it can go to some really serious things. So that we've, we've got some serious things to look at here. There's, um, it, it, can, it can really get messy. It can really, really hurt, you know? We, we've been convinced to, to do things in our own lives, in our own hearts, and with our own relationships. We've been convinced, we've convinced ourselves, and it's just absolutely bananas that we could get there. So the, the things that we believe but shouldn't believe. We get to this place right here. The things that we believe, but shouldn't believe. Things that, that we have uh, done or about to do, but we should not do. I mean, th these are, this is a, another list here of things that it's like, how could we get to this point? How could we get here? Um, things that, that we feel we are owed, even at the cost of others. I mean, this is more than just guessing wrong or this, about a pregnant woman or more than just jumping fences and, and stealing like golf flags. This is, this is absolutely life-changing stuff. So what, what can we do? Okay, what, what is it that we can do about this? You know, I, I, I've, I hope, and I don't know if I've done a good job at it, so I just want you to hear this, but, but the point to all of this, this introduction to this series is, is that, that God gave us sort of this thing in us that, that holds us accountable. It talks to us. It, it's this tension that rises in us. And we end up doing things that we never would have thought we would have done. And it's like, how did we get there? Well, there are some things that we can do about that. And the first thing we can do is we can learn to pay attention to the tension that we feel. And so how do we know how to do that? How, how do we know how to, how to learn to pay attention to the tension that we feel? The first thing that we do is we, we have to catch it and then we have to take it captive. So we have to start telling ourselves, okay, when as soon as I feel this little thing pile up in me, this little hesitation, I'm gonna catch it. I'm gonna catch it and I'm gonna hold it captive and I'm gonna take it and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sit with it right there. In fact, for me, um, I found so much value in just hitting pause. So, I mean, it, it, it sounds like such a simple thing, but take the thought, take, take the tension, catch it, bring it into sort of captivity, and then hit pause. Hit pause for a moment. It's just a moment. Just hit pause. And I, I've actually got this thing that, that I've started doing that I think more people should do, and it's called the 24-hour rule. And some of my friends will know this because we say this to each other a lot. The 24-hour rule says when you get that email that comes in, you wait 24 hours before you respond. When someone makes you upset, you wait 24 hours. When maybe you don't get what you think you're owed or you don't get what you think you deserve, 
You wait 24 hours. When, when you want to uh, go spend money, when you want to buy that new product or, or do that new thing, give it, just pause, listen to the tension, and then give it 24 hours, the 24-hour rule. Because see, the purpose to the pause, the purpose and the reason that we're pausing is, is it's, the, it's the pause that we learn to pay attention to the tension. It's in the pause that we learn to pay attention to the tension. In the pause, we put a stop to our old behavior and patterns and give new behavior and patterns a chance. If we never pause, then we never get this, we never get this chance. You know, there's, there's so many scenarios and situations where a pause is like an awkward thing. Like it, it feels awkward. You know, even, even here, as I'm speaking to you guys that aren't in the room, but you are on TV, if I just pause in the room, I can promise you, every person in the tech uh, room right now is saying, what is he doing? Why is he not talking? That pause, it's a scary, scary thing. The pause is scary. But if we don't pause, then we never give ourselves a chance for new behaviors and new patterns to, to come. So I'm going to talk more about this through a story that I absolutely love. Um, it's the story of David and Saul. Such a good story. So we find that in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, which is actually our Old Testament, okay, before it was old, it was first just the Hebrew text. And so, um, but in it is the story of David and Saul. And, and with this story, uh, we learn so much about what happens when you pay attention to the tension. So let me give you guys just the absolute shortest history of David and Saul um, up to this point right here. So David is a shepherd boy, and David grows up, and then this guy Samuel, who's a prophet, comes into Jesse's house, which is David's dad, and says, I want to see all your sons. And then he, he sees them all, and they're not the king, because Samuel's trying to find the one that he thinks is going to be the king, because God's told him to go do that. And David is like the little runt, and he's out in the back, and he's not doing anything. And they bring David in, and Samuel's like, yeah, David's going to be the king. David's like, cool. And then he goes back out with the sheep, because he's a shepherd. That's what he is. That's what he does. So that's David. Well, then this big dude named Goliath, he comes. He's a Philistine. He's basically a bad guy. And he stands up and he says, hey, I'm going to intend. He basically punks out the whole army of Israel. So Saul, who's the king at the time, is saying, like, I don't want to go fight this, uh, this big Philistine dude. Um, Goliath is standing in the middle and he's basically like, anyone that wants to come fight me, you can, but, but you know, you're, you're not going to win. The whole army is afraid of Goliath. David, the shepherd, is taking cheese to his brothers. And then he shows up and, and David says, why the heck are we not fighting this guy? And so he throws a stone and kills Goliath. Goliath goes down. And so David kind of becomes famous. Then Saul brings David into the kingdom he gives David favor in military, gives David a daughter as a wife, and you have David who's rising in fame, and then you have Saul who's getting more and more and more insecure, and what ends up happening is Saul tries to kill David, and David flees. Now, there's so much more to this story, but the point is we go from a little shepherd boy doing an amazing thing, getting built up in fame, and then all of a sudden, He's, he becomes the, the biggest thing in the kingdom, and then the biggest guy in the kingdom, the king, gets intimidated and tries, tries to absolutely just kill him. The Bible actually says he tried to pin him to a wall with a spear, but his spear stuck into the wall. A spear sticking into a stone or wood wall is a pretty hard throw. And that, that's what Saul does, and David flees. Da David goes out. So that brings us to this moment in time where... David is out hiding, and he's got all the other people that have been outcast from their culture and their society that have joined him because they're like, David's a, a cool dude, and I'm going to just follow David. So they go to David, and they, um, David ends up with like an army, and he's, he's, he's hiding in the land, and, and he has spies, and these spies find out that Saul is coming, and Saul has spies, and Saul's spies find out that David has spies and David's spies find out that Saul's spies are coming, so they both 
find out through spies that they're going to meet each other. And so David says, guys, we're going to the caves. So he actually retreats and all the men hide in, hide in these caves. And this is where it gets amazing. It's where it truly gets amazing. Imagine this. Saul, the king, he gets 3,000 men, a 3,000 man army to hunt David down and kill David. He takes these, these 3,000 men and marches towards where he thinks David may be. And in, in the middle of that, Saul says, I, I've got to go to the bathroom. I've got, to, I've, I've got to take a leak. I think it's pretty fitting that my first sermon as the lead pastor of this church involves the only documented bathroom break in the Bible. I, I think that that's just a, a, very, a very fitting thing for my life. So anyway, Saul stops the whole train because he's got to let a little air out of the tire. So he decides, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go to the toilet. And so all 3,000 people stop and Saul walks into a cave and wouldn't you know it that, that Saul walks into a special cave. So we're actually going to look at, at 1 Samuel here. I want to show you some text. So 1 Samuel 24, 2. Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel, and he set out to look for David and his men. Okay, so we know that part of the story. He came to the sheep pens along the way. I wonder if David thought, let me hide in the sheep pens or around the sheep pens so that we can't be smelled or something like that. Or Saul thinks, well, this is a great place to use the bathroom because the sheep are already here. I don't know. So anyway, a cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. That's actually in the, that's actually in the text right there. Saul went in to relieve himself. So this is where the plot twist is. Saul, Saul takes a break. Saul goes in the cave to relieve himself. And David and his men are in the same exact cave. I mean, just imagine that. Of all the caves, there's thousands of caves built into this, uh, into this landscape. And David is in a cave, and Saul takes a random bathroom break, and he walks into the same cave that David's in. I mean, remember, David's been hunted, and, and Saul's tried to kill him. Saul's tried to completely kill David, and Saul walks into a cave, not knowing that David's in there, and he, he's, he's going to use the bathroom. You're never more vulnerable than when you're using the bathroom, you know? Maybe if you're giving, uh, maybe women and, and childbirth is, is a more vulnerable thing, but something that we all experience is a bathroom break. Can you just imagine the scene? Saul walks into the cave to go to the bathroom. It's quiet. Nobody hears anything. It's just quiet. And then out of the cave walks David, and he's just got Saul's head in his hands, and he drops it, and it's the biggest flex in the Bible. David's just like, boom, drops it. I mean, imagine what that scene would be like. But that's not actually what happened. So David is in the back of the cave, and he's got this incredible, incredible tension building in him. Because here he is, and remember, he's got all these men with him. And David is battling because he's got this tension that's building, but he's also made this promise. All these men that have been following David, they're also outcasts. They're, they're also men that don't have a place in society. And so David has been telling these men, guys, God is going to deliver the kingdom to us, and one day we will be able to return home. And then Saul walks into the cave, and he takes his cloak or whatever off. He actually does take his cloak off. And, and his men are like, David... Now, there's probably not a better opportunity than now. And so David's like, I've got this promise. I've got this promise, but I feel this tension. And David does what we all would do. David grabs a knife and starts walking towards Saul. He ignores the tension. So he, knife in hand, he takes a step, and he's closer to freedom. David takes another step, closer to freedom. Another step, and David's men are closer to freedom. David takes another step. He's so close to Saul, and freedom and the end is right there, within reach. But David doesn't do it. Instead, David pauses. And it's in that pause that something different was allowed to come out of David's heart. And the Bible says that he actually, he kneels down 
And we, we can look in verse, verse six and seven here. It says, David, David kneels down and he, he cuts a corner off of Saul, Saul's uh, cloak. And the, the scripture actually says that Saul had discarded his cloak, which means that Saul took his clothes off to go to the bathroom. Um, and David, he, he cuts a corner off of it and then he goes back to his men. There was a reframe there. That reframe happened in the pause. Then when David gets back to his men, you know, he sneaks back in the cave and his men are like, David, why didn't you do that? And David actually says in verses uh, six and seven here, we'll put it on the screen for you. He says to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. How many of us can say that about a bad boss? Well, David is saying it about a king that tried to kill him. David goes on to say, with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went away. I can't, I can't believe it. David, his men were probably just like, what are we doing? Why are we following you? What happened? You were right there. All you had to do is stab him. Things over. Things, life is done. But David didn't do that. So my, my question to you guys is, are you at the back of the cave or are you at the back of the man? Are you, are you close? Are you close like David? Is there something in your life that maybe you're, you're really close to doing? Is there something that, that you're like talking yourself into? Is there, is there something that you're selling yourself on? Is there a tension that you're feeling? Where, where are you in the process of from the back of the cave to the back of Saul? Where's your tension at in that? You know, how much are you actually selling yourself on an idea that's going to lead to you killing a king? So what I want to do is, again, I want to lean into this pause for the tension. We're just going to take a breath. I want you to think in your mind, what is that thing that I'm close to doing? What, what is that? And just deep breath in and let it out. We just took a pause. And, and no, one, no one died. We just took a pause. We took a break. It's time that we hit pause and we actually stop selling ourselves. And then we start listening. So when David hit pause and stopped selling himself on what he wanted to do, he allowed himself to listen to that still small, quiet voice that was speaking to him. You know what that is? That's like our gut. That's like our internal gut. Like, are you listening to your gut? And that, that thing that, that you're close to doing, that thing that you, you struggle with, where maybe it's finances, or maybe it's um, uh, the way you treat your wife, or the way you treat your husband, or maybe it's uh, your thought life, or maybe it's the, the fact that you hate your boss, or whatever it is, this tension that, that's building and your gut feeling that's telling you like, no, this is wrong. The way you talk to your mom is wrong. The way you haven't called your dad is wrong. You got this, this gut feeling that's building, that's building, it's building. And, and what are we doing? Are we taking our, our tensions and we're just pushing those aside? Are you, I want you to ask yourself, that thing, whatever it is, are you really ready to do that? Are you really ready to kiss her? Are you really ready to let go of that marriage? Are you really ready to whatever it is? Whatever happens in your day, maybe it's something as simple as, hey, it's bedtime. Are you, are you really going to eat that spoon of peanut butter? You know, it's not about the calories. Sometimes it's about how much you hate yourself. Are you, are you really going to self-loathe in what you eat? Are you really, with the spoon there, I mean, this may seem silly, but to a lot of people out there, you know, this guy included, this, this, is, this is as real for everyone as it is for anyone else. Are you ready? You know what? You don't have to do that. You can just take a breath and just hit pause. If we can just hit pause, we can, we can listen to God's voice. We can listen to, maybe you don't know God. Maybe you're not a Christian. But you still feel tension because you're a human. 
And when you hit pause, maybe you hear this little whisper. Well, let me tell you what that little whisper is. You think it's your gut. You think it's maybe just like this innate, like right and wrong that you have, but it's not. It's actually, it's actually God's whisper because God's for you. So, so in, that, in that gut feeling, in that tension that's rising, God may actually be keeping you from becoming your own worst enemy. So let's, let's go back to the story. Let's go back to this. So Saul, remember, Saul walks out of the cave. David's men are like, what did you, why did you not do that? David rebukes him. And this, this is amazing. Saul walks out of the cave, no clue. I mean, just imagine him kind of like hiking his pants up or his cloak up a little bit. And he's like, you know, I mean, obviously COVID wasn't around then. So there's no like uh, squirt sanitizer that he's walked up to. But he walks out of the cave and he's walking down to the men. And all of a sudden, Saul hears this. It's probably, it had to have been a nightmare. This voice, this voice that comes, comes out of the cave. Saul. Hey, Saul. Saul thinks, why, why on earth do I know that voice? And he pauses and he thinks, how on earth could I be hearing that voice? Hey, Saul. Saul turns around. Guess who's standing there? David's there. Then David, he gets, he gets down on one knee. He doesn't say, hey, I, I told you so, or hey, I got you. He gets down on one knee, and he assumes a position of humility. And he, he holds out his hand, and he opens his hand, and in his hand is the piece of Saul's cloak, the piece that he cut off. And right then and there, in that moment, every single person in that army all 3,000 men, they knew who the better man was. They knew that it wasn't Saul, that it was David. So David declares that Saul is going to be uh, unharmed. David says, you know what, Saul? You, you are the king. Who am I to actually hurt you? Who, who am I to actually be able to do that? So if we look at 1 Samuel verse 12 here, David says to Saul, he, so he rises up with the cloak in his hand and he says, may the Lord be the judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hands will not touch you. So David says, I'm doing the right thing here. I, I'm doing the right thing. And, and Saul's bad behavior is no excuse for me to have bad behavior. Saul's bad behavior trying to stick me with a spear does not give me an excuse to stick Paul or to stick Saul with a knife. So how many of us are looking at, hey, I'm going to do this thing that I'm going to do because they've done this or that. Someone else's bad behavior doesn't actually excuse you from your bad behavior. Bad behavior is bad behavior. It doesn't matter. It, it just, it doesn't matter. It's bad behavior. And David recognized that. And he recognized that when he paused and he paid attention to the tension. So, so what I would ask you guys is, is are you close? How, how close are you? How close are you? Because are, are you close because he, he got what they don't deserve or because she did what she, what she shouldn't have done or, or because he did this to me or she did that to me or because of this or because of that or because, 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 because. Is, has that brought you to a point where you're close? You know, considering, is it making you consider an action that you maybe wouldn't take? All the becauses? When we look at the story of David, David didn't let any of the becauses actually make him or give him the right to, to take an action that he shouldn't have done. So all, all eyes now, we'll go back to the story. All the eyes are on David. Everyone's looking at David. And Saul's just been served, this huge, humble serve. And Saul... He wasn't humiliated by the fact that David was an amazing warrior. Saul was humiliated by David's character and his humility. Saul was, was absolutely humiliated by David's ability to give tension a voice. So David, he paid attention to the tension. He hit pause and he defeated a king. 
Saul turned and left. Now, now that's power. David defeated a king because he paused. And Saul turned and left. So I, I want to close with this. I, I feel like this. We've been on a we've been on a journey together. We've, we, we've you know laughed and told funny stories. We've talked about tension and David and all that stuff. But the most important thing that I want you to get from this is is where do we find Jesus in this? And where are you in this? Because see, here at, at South Point Church, we're all about Jesus. Whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus, we're all about Jesus. And, and I want to make sure you know exactly where you can find Jesus in this story. So like, like for you, are you David? Are you Saul? Are you one of David's mighty men who are saying, hey, David, let's, let's kill this dude. Let's do this thing. Are you at the back of the cave? Or are you standing at the back of the man giving pause, paying attention to the tension? So un- unlike Saul, who was, who was a, a bad king, and unlike David, who would go on to be an, a very imperfect king, we have Jesus, who is our absolute perfect king. That's, that's where Jesus is in this story. Jesus, he loves you. Jesus, he is absolutely for you. Wherever you are in the story, whatever man you are in the story, whatever stage you're at in the cave, whatever king you are at the time, whether you're King David or King Saul, I want you to know that Jesus is the same for all. Jesus is for you. Jesus is the guy that came and he died on a cross so that you can have that gut feeling that says, hey, just hit pause because I want to give you something that's going to make your life so much better because Jesus he loves you and he's for you and when we hit pause and we pay attention to the tension that's building inside of us we give our hearts a chance to get quiet and then we can hear this whisper right here we hear the whisper he loves you and he's for you so we're going to pray here and close this out um I think it's really important that if this has made any impact on you, if this is, has uh, resonated with you in any way, whether you're saved or not saved, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, it doesn't matter. You're a person. And because you're a person, you're a you. And because you're a you, he loves you and he is for you. And because he loves you and he's for you, guess what? South Point Church loves you and South Point Church is for you. So uh, we just want you to know you're important. Whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever it is that you're going through uh, as you listen to this sermon, please reach out. You can catch us on social media. You can send us an email. You can, you can send me an, an email, chris.lad at southpointchurch.co.za. Um, I would be absolutely happy to walk with you through whatever journey you're going on. Um, so yeah, next week we're gonna go through part two of this. I'm gonna give you guys the second habit And uh, I'll be excited to see you there. So let me pray and close this out. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the story of you being a perfect king. Thank you so much, Father, for the, um, yeah, just the chance and opportunity to be loved by you. Thank you that you put tension in us because it causes us to pause and it's good for us. It keeps us from doing things that would otherwise lead us into places where we would get in trouble, we would get hurt, or we would get broken. So Father, I pray for everyone that's heard this message. I pray, Lord, that they give pause to the tension. And in that pause, Jesus, I pray that you just explode with grace and loving kindness and wisdom all over their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Southwind Church, thank you.